Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth in combination once again or in collaboration once again with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Yeah, he has a platform now on Hour of the Truth on YouTube, but that is not daily as it used to be, that is more or less weekly and um, yeah, we have to see to get Tom to a new computer that he finally does the final steps to uh, get the computer so that he can upload a quote-unquote SHIT load of videos that are absolutely necessary for him to get out on his own channel and spread the word once again that was so uh, yeah unrighteously shut up by this special person. I don't even mention his name now. It's not necessary to talk about those fools who are standing in the way of spreading the word of God and the truth in this world just because they are fixed on money. We are not fixed on money. We are fixed on, for the moment, uh, the Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. This is part four of our study of that subject. And of course, we deviated a little bit by going into the book Code Word Babylon, um, book two. Antichrist is a woman, alive and well again. And um, we were starting last time reading in the wonderful chapter Evangelicals and Catholics together, the dog returns to his vomit. And um, Tom and I were just speaking about before the recording, just briefly, um, about how important this um, Catholic, Catholics and, uh, and Catholics and Evangelicals together, how this ecumenical, how important this um, ecumenical movement actually is. Because the Roman Catholic Church cannot achieve a quote-unquote one world order or a new world order without getting rid of all its enemies. And the easiest way to win your enemy over is to infiltrate them and make them your own. And this is what the Jesuits are absolute masters in since the last, yeah, I have, sorry, I'm sorry, I have to say almost 500 years. And they have achieved a lot. And the ecumenical movement that um, really took a very um, decisive turn in the mid 1960s, um, so about some 60 years ago, um, that was a cornerstone of that. And uh, at that meeting, at that council, there were decisions made um, which fruits are now coming out piece by piece. I mean, they came out a few years later, they came out 20 years ago, but they are coming out now also. And the point that Tom and I were going to make, and, and Tom made that point, and I just added a little bit to it, um, he said that the Roman Catholic Church uh, says that Christ is divided because of Protestantism. Uh, is Christ divided because of uh, Protestantism splitting of the Roman Catholic Church? Uh, I don't think so, but that is of course what the world thinks. That is of course what the world and especially the Roman Catholic Church teaches because the Roman Catholic Church officially claims to be Christianity claims to be the only church without which there is no salvation for any man in the world. The Pope declares himself to be the um, placeholder of Jesus Christ here on earth. He even declares himself to be the placeholder of God here on earth. And I think in one of the last broadcasts we went into the, um, a few of those quotes like um, when the Pope said, I don't know which one it was anymore, but when the Pope said, um, I can do almost anything God can do. Uh, so what do you make of me but God? So the God, the Roman Catholic Church, sells to the people. And the Jesus Christ, the Roman Catholic Church, sells to the people, is another God and another Jesus Christ and the one of Scripture. But of course, the Roman Catholic Church uses the term Christ is divided because of the uh, schism. Yeah, there were two schisms in the Roman Catholic Church, the first in the midst of the 11th century, which resulted into the splitting of the quote-unquote Orthodox Church, the Greek and Russian Eastern Orthodox Church, from the Roman Catholic Church, and the second one about 500 years later with the, uh, with the Reformation. So therefore, the Roman Catholic Church um, claims that Christ is divided, 
And I just answered Tom in that regard. That is an interesting point that we should pick up, pick up before camera uh, or on camera. That's why I'm talking about this now. And Tom will fill in in a second. Uh, Christ is not divided because the Roman Catholic Church does not does not represent Christ, but the Roman Catholic Church is divided, and Protestantism is not true Protestantism if it is not based on the Bible. Um, interestingly enough, I had yesterday evening um, a client in my taxi who claimed to be a Protestant. And I just asked him, so what are you protesting? Oh, well, that, that, that's not all about, that's just the name. I said, no, <laughs> it's not a name. <laughs> you got to know what you protest. And I told him about uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale and Martin Luther and how Martin Luther protested the, um, uh, Tom, help me out, what was it? Um, the uh, letters of... Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's what's it called in English again? Or are um, you talking about indulgences? Yeah, indulgences. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The indulgences when he made 95 theses about this. And of course, he and the other uh, Protestants protested that the Roman Catholic Church and especially the papacy is the Antichrist. And uh, he had no idea of that. And I, I just told him, what kind of a Protestant are you when you don't even know what you are protesting? And don't even equate what you're doing with protests. Yeah, but I live on the Bible. I say, yeah, I know many people who say that. But when a push comes to shove, they haven't even read their Bible. I said, what do you, what's your standpoint on Daniel chapter 9? And he had no idea what I was talking about. So <laughs> this man is, even though he says he is not, he is a prime example of an evangelical. He is a prime example of someone who doesn't even know what he's protesting, who doesn't even know what his true beliefs are. Uh, when he says, uh, I'm a Bible believer, and you ask him things out of the Bible, and he has no idea what the Bible says. S same with the Roman Catholic. Most Roman Catholics you cannot discuss on the Bible because they don't know what the Bible says. They know what the priest says. They know what the hierarchy says. They know what the catechism says. But they don't know what the Bible says because they don't study the Bible, and especially, and surely, they don't study the Bible all by themselves. So is Christ divided? Yeah, the Roman Catholic Church is divided, not Christ. Christ is divided. Christ is separated, I answer Tom on that regard. Christ is separated from the Roman Catholic Church because the Bible clearly says, how can two walk together lest they agree? And the Bible also says that we should have nothing to do with the powers of uh, 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 or the um, yeah with the powers of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's what we are going to do, and that's why I call Tom's and my ministry sure true Protestants. We shout it from the rooftops as often as we can together, using other papers, um, studying those and explaining those to help us to foment actually what we have to say, to shout it from the rooftops that the papacy is the Antichrist and that this one world religion, one world new world order, which is not new at all, it's just a restoration of the old world order under new terms, um, that that cannot take place unless the Roman Catholic Church actually defeats all her enemies. And here you can see how the Roman Catholic Church wants, wants to achieve the same thing that God is going to achieve because he said, more or less, that Christ will return when God made all his enemies his footstool, which is just the same thing. Ah, anyway, Tom, I have a, I had a load to tell, but I guess people really want to hear what you have to say now, especially well, in this I, regard. I, I, I don't want to stop you. You were doing very well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, this whole idea that Christ is divided is the hammer with which the papacy hits on the head the Protestant and evangelical churches. That, uh, that we're naughty boys, we Protestants and evangelicals, because we left the only church whereby salvation is even available. And that is the Roman Catholic Church, according to their teaching. And now, you don't need me to tell you this, because you're probably a regular listener, but... The Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. 
okay? The papacy is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. The papacy is the antichrist. The papacy is, was, and always will be the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy. Don't look for a future antichrist. He's been throughout the entire Christian era, okay? Growing slowly over the centuries, but now in a position of global supremacy. And this is what lies behind the papacy's uh, conquering of the Protestant and evangelical churches. And uh, why did they need to be conquered? Well, because they, 500 years ago, came to the stark realization, the irrefutable realization, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And they shouted it from the rooftops, and they liberated nearly all of Europe from papal control. Okay? And you maybe have heard it even mentioned in a, in a famous uh, rock and roll song years ago, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, that, the, that, the, that they came to this country seeking uh, freedom and hope. And without kings and popes, you remember that song? Most people don't remember it, but it was telling us how the United States was created. It was created because the papacy was known then to be the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy. And the people of Europe under Roman control, and all the governments of Europe were controlled by the papacy, and the governments of the world did the bidding of the papacy, and the people were oppressed. They were held away from the Bible, or the, rather the Bible was held away from them, and uh, they knew nothing of Scripture except for what the priests taught. And when the, when the Protestants or, and Evangelicals began to print the Bible in the, in the language of the people so that they could read it for themselves rather than the, the, the dead language of Latin, they, they confirmed all that they'd been taught. The papacy is the man of sin. They were convinced. And there was no protest against the papacy until it was understood that the papacy was the Antichrist. That's when the protest began. They protested the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And uh, they came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, we're supposed to believe that uh, uh, nothing has transpired ba back then, uh, for, since then, uh, but that's not true. The, the Vatican swore that it would destroy the Protestant Reformation lock, stock, and barrel and reabsorb all those nations, reabsorb all those governments, reabsorb all those people, <clears throat> or, or else. And so the Jesuits uh, fomented and organized and conducted uh, the Council of Trent, which took place about 50 years after the Protestant Reformation took place. And it was an all uh, it was a declaration of an all out war of annihilation of the Protestants and evangelicals. They, they, they were traitors of God. They were traitors of the Pope, his man in Rome. And uh, they either repent and come back to the Roman Catholic Church with their tail between their legs or else and you know what or else means their blood still cries to god from the ground these are the martyrs of jesus who would not capitulate to rome who would not bow the knee to the pope no more than shadrach meshach and abednego would bend the knee to nebuchadnezzar and his image that's how well that's what they thought of the papacy and that's what they thought of the kings of the earth that ruled under his behest and tyrannized the people. And uh, so Rome and the governments of Europe went to war against them, and part of that war was the Council of Trent. It was an open, global 
declaration of an all-out war of annihilation against the Protestants. The Protestants had overturned the Pope's power. And the Pope was not going to tolerate it. Being the so-called vicar of Christ, the replacement of God on earth, he was not going to have his power overthrown. And the Jesuits were going to see to it that the Protestants were all either killed or brought back into the church, and that the governments of the world were either destroyed and replaced with papal governments or annihilation. And that's where the bloody wars began. Now, part of that war was a a a, a um, corruption of eschatology, that is the study of Bible prophecy. In other words, another interpretation of Bible prophecy that would exonerate the papacy. And what if one believed what they taught, then one would have to concede that the papacy not only is not, but cannot be the Antichrist of Scripture. And that lie of eschatology is called by Yerk and myself and others futurism. That the Antichrist is not the historical papacy, but a single individual that comes at the end of time. So that means if you believe that the Antichrist cannot come until the, just before Christ returns in this so-called future 70th week of Daniel, and we could go into that again, but that's we've been over that so many times, I'm afraid we'd lose listeners if we went over it again. But in this so-called future 70th week of Daniel, an Antichrist would come and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease in Jerusalem and declare himself God of gods, okay? And automatically you know if there's a future Jerusalem with a future temple and animal sacrifices, then there has to be a restoration of the nation state of Israel. You can't, you can't have animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem if there's no Israel on the planet. So they created the modern nation state of Israel. They got a temple built ready to be built. They've got all the utensils for the temple. They got all the priesthood. And when they get all that done, they'll have somebody stand up, you know, like Mitt Romney or somebody with graying temples come in and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease and the whole world to believe he's the Antichrist. But the truth is, and what all the Protestants believed, that it was the papacy that was the Antichrist, and it was Jesus 2,000 years ago, or as the, in the case may be during this period of time, 1,500 years ago, it was he who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he became himself the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, that took away our sins, and caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease because he alone is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. To end sin. To put sin away. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The recompense for sin was placed on him. He suffered for us all. And now there's no more sacrifices. And to prove it, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom, threw open the Holy of Holies. And what did we discover? Certainly, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in there. It hadn't been in there. No one knows where it had been, where it was hidden. So it was all charade anyway. And everybody knew it. The people knew it. The priests knew it. The Romans knew it. Everybody knew it. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in there. So what happens to the sacrifice? It's over. And to make sure nobody sewed the veil of the temple back together and continued that charade, that lying charade, 
God used the Roman 10th Legion to destroy that temple, to level it to the ground, not one stone remaining upon another. No, the message from heaven was, you either accept the lamb that was provided for you as was promised and covenanted to Abraham, or you go without a sacrifice. Because Jesus, my lamb, my only begotten son, put an end to animal sacrifices by becoming himself the Lamb of God, the Savior, the blood that takes away the sin of the world. He is your Passover. And that's what the Protestants and evangelicals finally understood. There's no future Antichrist. It's historical. And it was the Antichrist, the papacy, who put a stop to this teaching. How did they do that? By saying the Antichrist is future. Not to come until just before Christ returns. And the whole Protestant and evangelical world finally conceded to that diabolical lie. And when they did it, they exonerated the papacy. And not only that, now could be seen by the world as traitors of Christ, dividers of Christ, because their war against the papacy was ill-conceived from the very beginning. Their false teaching about the Roman Catholic Church is now come home to roost. And then we got what we know today as the Ecumenical Council, Vatican Council II. And that was when the papacy declared total victory over the Protestants and evangelicals. You believe in a future Antichrist now. That means you've exonerated, whether you'll admit it with your mouth or not, you have exonerated totally the papacy. And now you must come back to Rome, whether you like it or not. And that was Vatican Council too. And, of course, you can't use those kinds of terms if you're going to drag the Protestants and evangelicals back into the Roman Catholic Church. No, you got to do it with sugar and spice and everything nice. And so now they call it the ecumenical movement to draw the Protestant evangelical churches back into Holy Mother Church. Without offending them, get them to come back. They're already halfway there. They no longer believe the papacy is the Antichrist. They believe in a future cockamamie pipe dream, and they're ripe for the picking. And that's what they've done. They've picked the Protestants and evangelicals like imbeciles off of the tree, and now they're bringing them back to Rome. That's what the ecumenical movement is. It's a total capitulation of Protestant and evangelicalism. And that's why the person that Yerk talked to in his cab knew nothing about what the pro- the protest was about. He doesn't know that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And he doesn't know what the Antichrist resembles. <coughs> he doesn't know and, what the Antichrist stands for. That's right. You know? And that, the, that's just typical, typical of everyone who calls himself a Christian in this world today. Yeah. The picture that I put up here, Tom, that you see now on your screen, uh, that is Ecumenism XXL. It is uh, a world prayer day uh, of of, a world day of prayer for peace in Assisi 2011. So this is not only Roman Catholics and Evangelicals together. This is Roman Catholics and Buddhists, Mohammedans, Buddhists, Hindus. Yeah. All these, all the religions of the world, none accepted. All the religions of the world, all together, praying for peace, a prayer for peace. the The interesting point is that when you followed Tom's and my channel for some time, then you know that all these quote unquote religions that are gathered there together have one thing in common. <laughs> They pray to the same God, even though they give him a different name. Yeah, and that is not the God of the Bible. No, that is not Yudhe Vavi, and that is not 
his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. That's right. And that's the big difference. And they come all creeping in the Roman Catholic Church voluntarily. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't even need to repeat their creed from years and years ago, which still is valid today, convert or die. They get them with, as Tom so wonderfully said, sugar-coated lies, with sugar right. and spice, you know. And this is why we had these two meetings in Assisi. The one was in 1986. I also have a picture of that. I can show you that here. Um, this was 1986 with uh, then Pope John Paul II, the one who was sleeping here in the middle, next to the Dalai Lama. And here, of course, is the uh, uh, patriarch of the uh, Orthodox Church, yeah, the one that that um, satanic apparition they call Mary um, said must come back to the Roman Catholic Church or otherwise. <laughs> and this is why we have this Ukraine war today, among other reasons, which nobody tells you ever that that Ukraine war is about religion, of course. So this was in uh, Assisi in 1986, and 15 years later you had the same in Assisi, this meeting, this uh, World Day of Prayer for Peace in 2011. And in the meantime, between 1986 and 2011, Tom, what happened in 1999? The Worldwide Lutheran Federation capitulated to the Roman Catholic Church by signing of all days on Reformation Day, 31st of October 1999, the Joint Declaration of Justification with the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. So the Luther, Lutheranism, Lutheranism died. And the more I think about it, you know, Tom, as much as I do, uh, you remember this uh, Bishop Palmer uh, who was there with uh, Kenneth Copeland and inviting the Pope to one of his meetings when he said when there's the protest is over when there's no protestant churches anymore why are you still what are you still protesting the protest is over and and he, and he is right because there is no protest anymore they have absolutely capitulated and meetings like this are an example and this was even still 13 years before the capitulation by paper. But I think the Pope knew already here that he had them in the hand because 1986, yeah, this is about the time uh, when we had this holy alliance with uh, Ronald Reagan a few years earlier, wasn't it? Yes. Wasn't that 1982 or something? Oh, it was 82 uh, or 84, one or the other. Yeah, anyway, yeah. The, the holy alliance between Pope John Paul II, Antichrist Pope John Paul II, and the American President Ronald Wilson Reagan, who conspired together to use the Solidarność movement of Poland to bring down uh, communism in the USSR. And what did they do? <laughs> they didn't bring down communism in the USSR. <laughs> they just made sure that that communism infiltrated all of the Western countries. And this is the reason, and this is a wonderful bridge to our subject, what we are talking about. This is the reason why Tom and I now started this reading and studying of Richard Bennett's paper, The Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. Because the socialist agenda is just a confirmation of what I just said, that communism didn't die. As Rome didn't die, by the way. <laughs> you know, Tom, isn't that interesting? They, they tell us... Rome fell in 476 and is dead. Rome doesn't rule anymore. And they said in 1989 or 1990, communism fell. It's the same trap. People are falling for it all over again. Certainly, because yeah. if Rome fell, really fell in 476, then the Bible and God are a liar. Because God sure. told through the angel Gabriel in the book of Daniel, that there will be four sec uh, consecutive kingdoms until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Babylon was, after it came Medo-Persia, that was succeeded by Greece, and then came Rome. 
So if Rome fell in 476, then Christ must have returned in 476. I can assure you, he didn't. <laughs> we are not living in the millennium. Christ is still in heaven, and the Father is still making his enemies his footstool. And when that is completed, he will come back. So they told us Rome fell, and Rome didn't fall. They told us communism fell, and, Ro uh, and communism didn't fall. Communism just took on another coating so that it will not be recognized that much anymore. Now, nowadays, what do they call it, Tom? Didn't we open the website? World Goodwill <laughs> and the Common Good? Those are the terms they use today for that very well, same thing. If, if you will, put that photo, photograph back up that you just removed there so the listeners can see. Uh what this photograph represents is the fact, the undeniable fact that Rome never fell because this is Rome. This is the Roman Empire still in power. And what this photograph depicts is the, the Roman King of Kings and Lord of Lords sitting there in white and all the other religions of the world bowing down to him. He's conquered the whole world. Rome never fell. Rome has grown in leaps and bounds till it has become a global, autonomous, unconquerable dictator of the whole world. And these that are sitting, sitting here with the Pope of Rome are those who have capitulated to him. Okay, the man of sin now isn't just a bishop of Rome, he's king of kings and lord of lords. That's a global Roman Empire. Okay? In Jesus' time, it was a fledgling thing. Now it is global. And of course, they passed off the whole world that the that the Roman Empire uh, collapsed back in 400 and something, 476 A.D. It's all nonsense. It's all a lie. Interesting is, Tom, that, of course, the um, so-called fall of Rome in 476 is described in the Bible, as many people don't understand because they read the Bible in a different way and get an explanation of uh, chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, which is completely different that that fall of Rome resulted in the rise of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And that is the healing of the wound. And we are going into that in, uh, in another study more detailed. But they are uh, just uh, repeating uh, what happened then when the, with the fall of Rome and then the wound was healed. Now 1990 so-called communism fell and what is the wound healing? Three papal words I give you. Caritas in veritate. Yep. The new global constitution is what it really amounts to. A new global constitution authored by the man of sin in Rome. Abolishing two of God's commandments in one strike. The commandment, thou shalt not steal, and the commandment, thou shalt not covet. Because if another doesn't own anything that you don't own too, you cannot covet, do you? And if nobody owns something, you cannot steal something, can you? Two commandments of God done away with in one strike. You have to give it to the papacy, Tom. It's quite a genius, and people don't even see it. Oh, that's when the 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 prophet and apostle John said that when he'd seen the vision of this final man of sin, he said, "When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration." Yeah, he was speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why I used the feminine to describe it. Uh, women are always referred to in the Bible as churches. Churches are referred to in the feminine. 
Especially okay. when you read Cold World Babylon Book 2, Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well, you will understand that because on more than 300 pages, the author goes in, in, into the explanation of exactly what Tom here just said in a few words. The author takes more than 300 pages to make that point. And when you read yeah. that book, you cannot get over that point without accepting it. It's a, it's a magnificent deception. It has deceived the whole world. And, and what can you say of it but that it's admirable to be so fully conquering of the world so it's cunning. just it's just words cannot describe the magnificence of this total deception of the whole world yeah how does the bible it's, say it's, if it know, were possible even the, they even get the elect right the very elect that's right and there aren't many of those left. There are not many of those left. As clearly indicated how poorly received this message is and uh, how many people uh, respond to the truth when they hear it. I mean, look, Yerk, uh, you know, we are regarded by the lion's share. And how much does the lion share? Nothing. The lion's share of Christianity today would view you and me as dividers and not uniters. Okay? We are the ones who are dividing Christ. It's people like you and me who are holdouts of the Protestant evangelical belief system and eschatology that are holding up and promoting this division or separation from Rome. And so it is we who are the dividers and not the uniters. But anybody in their right mind would not mix Christ with Antichrist. Uh, no one who loves God would call Roman Catholicism Christianity. Yeah, that's right. But the problem is most people don't know their God, Tom. No, they don't. They don't know their God and they don't know the anti-God, the papacy. And that's why the world is so easily led about by the nose. And uh, when someone comes along who seems to know something and a truth that besets, literally besets all of this futurist, all of this uh, uh, ecumenical, virtually the entire Christian world is seen as a heretic. You're, you're, you're beating your head against a global wall of ignorance. And so why would you waste your time and everyone else's in a failed attempt? Well, that is because we haven't heard yet from the Creator, and I already know what He says. Uh, we're not to be united with the man of sin in Rome. We're not to worship him or obey him, and we're not to worship and obey the governments over which he rules, and we're not to throw away God's holy law, God's holy immutable law and then submit the whole world to a false law, an ungodly law, an antichrist law. And that's what ecumenism seeks to do. That's what globalism seeks to do. Listen, you've got to know that if a man is behind a globalism, it's not of God. Common sense tells you it's not of God. So why could you, how could you criticize somebody like me and Yerk who are denouncing this so-called ecumenical movement, denouncing this so-called global new world order, when it is not Christ who is organizing it? Christ has not yet come. Rome's still in power. And this common sense understanding that I have and that Yerk has and so many others that are of this belief and teaching seems 
almost insane to the normal ecumenical capitulatory new world order Christianity. But we're not going anywhere. We're not going to shut up. We're not going to change. And uh, we've set our course. And we're very well down the road. And uh, that's where we're heading. And if I were you, I'd get on board. Because the man of sin is going to enslave the entire world. And part of that enslavement is a global economic system and a global digital currency that if you don't obey, if you try to start another Protestant Reformation and stop Rome's advancement, they'll just shut off your bank account. You see, if we were carrying gold and silver and doing business like we did in the old days, they couldn't control us. That's why they couldn't control us then. But if we accept a, just for convenience sake alone, a digital currency, they own us lock, stock, and barrel. They can shut the door on our refrigerators. We won't even be able to eat. You won't be able to go to the grocery store and buy anything if you have no money with which to buy it. If they hold a key in their hand that can shut your bank account and not open it again, you can't buy or sell. And that's how they'll control you. They're not going to control me. Back to you, Jörg. There is another good point of what you are just saying about this control, Tom. That is something I wanted to say, I think, for a long time, actually, already. Uh, the last few years, you know, there's this agenda out that uh, because of quote-unquote global warming, um, CO2 is bad for you and they are shutting down uh, combustion engines all over the world and replacing them with electrical engines, especially in the cars. But in the normal uh, cars, uh, the car that you and I can own if you buy one, um, those cars don't only have an electric engine, which in itself is a great idea. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against electric engines. But it's everything surrounding these electric engines. All the technology that is in these cars, over the air updates, is still the smallest part. And Tesla is the forerunner with these electric cars. And of course, it has nothing to do with Nikola Tesla, the great technician of the 19th uh, and beginning of the 20th century, who was an absolute Satanist. And that is easy for you to research and do your own research. I did that in German. I'm not going to do that in English now. Um, but the point is that these cars today are not cars with a computer. They are computers that drive. And the more advanced all the features go, like lane assistant hold, autopilot and all that stuff, the more that go the, the further that goes in their agenda, the easier it is to even take over control of that car from far away. Let's say from the company that built the car. That you push the gas pedal or <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, electric engine pedal, whatever you want to call it, but it just doesn't accelerate. Or you push the brake pedal and it doesn't brake. The car does not what it wants, but what the people who control it want to do. Getting the people all dependent on these kinds of cars, and that is worldwide in giant steps, giant leaps, I almost said, advancing. And people just don't see that, that they are getting trapped like that. And that is a very easy example. That is just in the car, what Tom just said, that is all of your life. You cannot buy, you cannot sell. When you cannot buy anymore, you cannot even get water. If you don't have access to fresh water, you will die within a few days. Easy like that. Or if they forbid you to breathe, uh, think of the 15-minute cities. These are all things to come. 
and the control is taken away that of course they they sell that to you but oh you know that is so convenient you can let go of your uh, of your steering wheel and can read your paper in the meantime while driving and people say oh that's wonderful i can get indoctrinated even while i'm driving that's wonderful i'll still do that and they don't get what all is possible behind that and they are more and more just becoming really uh, puppets on a string and that's what the Roman Catholic Church wants. They want us all to be on their string. They call the shots and we run wherever they ask us to do or they tell us to do. When the Roman Catholic Church says jump, we jump. We don't ask when or why or how, but how high as high as the papacy sets the barrier that's how we're gonna jump and you have to warn the people in the beginning and this is what we're doing this is why i want to return to the book cold world babylon now tom if that's okay with you certainly um, we are still reading in this wonderful chapter uh, book two of two yeah the first one is called 666 danger in the vatican uh, the Sons of Loyola and their plans for world, uh, for world domination. Um, and then you have book two, Antichrist is a woman alive and well again. And we are stuck on page 449 last time, reading to you um, all these people who are the signers and supporters of the quote-unquote Manhattan Declaration. And I don't repeat all these people. You can read that on the last paragraph on page 449. But we are going to continue to read in this book now on page 450. Because when you have an understanding of the evangelical movement, especially the way that um, uh, P.D. Stewart um, uh, describes it in this book, then you will see what is going on. And this is why Tom and I decided to read this part to you. Evangelicals and Catholics together, as this chapter is called, is necessary to foment the new world order. When we are not all of one mind, and this is of course meant by the papacy, when we are not all of the Roman Catholic mind, there will not be a new world order. And the point is that if you are not of that mind, they get rid of you. For the moment, they are caressing you. They are negotiating you. They sugarcoat what they are telling you and try to sell you sweets. But you know, sweets can kill a man. So the author continues on page 450 and says, Having considered the Manhattan Declaration, note carefully the following statements of leading churchmen calling for a unifying of the religions of the world, uh, unifying for the religions of the world. What did we just see in this picture here? <laughs> 1986, even 25 years after P.D. Stewart wrote this book, because this book is, I guess, from 2009, so that's 23 years after. Okay? <laughs> he says here, of leading churchmen calling for a unifying of the religions of the world, including Islam or Mohammedanism, under the headship of the Pope. One, quote unquote, I, I add the quotes, Christian leader, Dr. Albert Outler, lamented that, quote, the scandal and tragedy of a divided Christendom, Tom, isn't that the point that we started our broadcast with? <laughs> Christ right, is divided. Right. Isn't that yep. interesting how this comes? Now? I, I didn't read this on before. <laughs> so. Well, that's that's the hammer that Rome uses to beat down the Protestants and evangelicals because they're the ones who, quote unquote, divided Christianity with the Protestant Reformation. So you first and foremost, if you if you if you uh, want to understand the unity that they seek, first of all, you have to acknowledge the division that resulted from the Protestant Reformation. And we're the ones to blame, according to Roman teaching. And that's what this is all about, placing blame 
on the Protestants and Evangelicals. After all, they started out believing the Pope is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Now they believe in a future Antichrist that hasn't even come yet and won't even come before just before Jesus returns. So they're the ones who were you have egg on their face. They're the ones who have to capitulate. They're the ones who have to surrender. Those are the ones who have to sign the armistice with Rome and come back to the church with their tail between their legs and eat the whole shebang without reservation. And that's what they demand. That's what ecumenism is. The Protestants and evangelicals have been conquered. They've been vanquished. They've been annihilated, and they've been humiliated. They've divided Christendom, and now they have to be a part of the unity of Christendom. And if there's any Protestant holdouts, they need to be destroyed. Back to you. So the quote says, The scandal and tragedy of a divided Christendom is a terrible thing. Ecumenism is God's clear imperative for our time. It is the unity Christ wills us to achieve. Unquote. I think, Tom, we better do not go into all the details of the lies in this little quote, because that will take us an hour, five hours. Yeah. We leave it for huh. the people to understand that for themselves, that the Bible clearly says, Jesus Christ clearly says, um, God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. It is those who the Father seeks to worship Him. That has okay. nothing to do with a with ecumenism. And uh, of course, when this guy speaks about God's clear imperative for our time, that's maybe true. But then he is not speaking of Yudhiwawi, of the God of the Bible, the Father, but he speaks of the God of this world, which is the dragon, Satan. Right. That's right. Archbishop Lokovos, the Greek Orthodox primate of North and South America, said, quote, Those who oppose Christian unity must ask themselves frankly whether they are Christians. Unquote. What? <laughs> Reader, I can hardly contain myself. <laughs> I think Tom has problems too in that regard. <laughs> Likewise, Archbishop Howard H. Clark believes that, quote, nothing less than the reunion of all Christendom should be our goal. Our aim should be the union not only of Protestants, but also with Greek Orthodox churches and even far away and difficult as it seems with the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. A 43-page document called The Gift of Authority was produced by an 18-member Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission after five years of debate. This commission amazingly concluded that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and I add the Biblical Antichrist, had a, quote, specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth, unquote. This is sublime nonsense. Recently, traditionalist Anglicans in Australia have become the first in that country to vote in favor of leaving their national church and converting to Roman Catholicism. Quote, Forward in Faith Australia, part of the Anglo-Catholic group that also has members in Britain and America, is setting up a working party guided by a Catholic bishop to work out how its followers can cross over to Rome. Group within the Anglican Church is to accept Pope Benedict XVI's unprecedented offer for disaffected members of the communion to convert and massive, uh, uh, en ma sorry, to convert en masse while retaining parts of their spiritual heritage. Under the terms of the Vatican's offer, made last October, Anglicans who are disillusioned with the Church's liberal direction will be allowed to enter into full communion with the Holy See. Now, Tom, I know that you will comment on that, full communion. What does full communion actually mean? 
that actually means you have to return to the mass, the sacrifice of the mass. Uh, you know, your communion, you can still call it communion if you want. Even the Roman Catholic Church now calls the mass communion. <clears throat> but it is a sacrifice. And it is a propitiatory sacrifice. It's one in which it is believed Christ is crucified afresh. Over and over and over, perpetually. He is a perpetual sacrifice. And he must be sacrificed always on the Roman Catholic Church. Otherwise, grace falls away. So Jesus has to die perpetu uh, perpetually. That's what the Mass is, a sacrifice. Now, I remind you that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago when he himself became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The sacrifice that cleanses us of sin, puts an end to sin, reconciles us to God, brings in everlasting righteousness. If it's everlasting, why do you have to sacrifice him over and over? You see how the, con the conflict is, the con contradiction? If you have to sacrifice Christ afresh, then what Jesus did on the cross means nothing. And that's what Satan's business is. So now the man of sin, the son of perdition, the real antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy is now demanding that all churches come into full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, to eat and drink damnation to themselves. There's no more perfect way to deny the blood of Christ than to make another sacrifice. When, sac when, when Christ put an end to sacrifices and oblations with his own blood. He put an end to it permanently forever. And then God leveled the temple to the ground so that nobody could ever do it again. The Roman Catholic Church insists that every church, every man, woman, and, and child on the planet come into full communion with the papacy, the man of sin in Rome. By, and this is the method by which you come into full communion if you participate in the sacrifice of the Mass. I mean, what would you expect Satan to do? What would you expect Satan to do to destroy every man, woman, and child on the planet with one stroke? That is to convince them they have to make another sacrifice. When Jesus put all sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's it. That is it. Spiritual rebellion to commit an unforgivable sin, which is nothing but denying the Christ that bought us all, to sit down with the Antichrist of Rome and eat and drink the blood and bread of his sacrifice, Satan's sacrifice. That's what it's all about. And you are blessed of God that a man has the courage to come to a microphone and tell you unequivocally and do it in terms that even an idiot can understand. I've told you. It makes sense to you. It's common sense. It's scriptural sense. It's eschatological and prophetic sense. It's undeniable. This is the mechanism by which Satan hopes to destroy all mankind and to do it with his man of sin in Rome. And it's happening. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening right now. Who else in the world, in history, or in the future, could you possibly imagine, might be more diabolical than this Pope of Rome, as we've described him, as P.D. Stewart has described him in this book? What more convincing do you need? Just keep your ear to the speaker. We'll continue to talk till Christ returns, because we've proven it. There's no way to gainsay it. There's no way to deny it. There's no way to 
to get around it. It is the truth. You don't have to wait for the future. You don't have to speculate. You can know concretely who the Antichrist is by what he says and what he does in this world and what he has done for nearly 1,500 years in this world. And if somebody proposes to you a future Antichrist, you can do like I do, laugh in their face and then set them straight. Back to you, Yerk. Interesting is when we read the sentence again under the terms of the Vatican's offer made last October Anglicans who are disillusioned with the church's liberal direction will be allowed to enter into full communion with the Holy See under the terms of the Vatican's offer so this offer is not a free gift it, it, it comes on special terms you have to fulfill it comes on conditions it comes with a agenda behind it Oh, we offer you this, you can get this, but only if. Do you really think that everyone who is member of these Anglican churches does uh, know what all these different terms are? The author continues to say, but they may be able to continue using their old prayer books and church services and will come under the new uh, under the pastoral care of a new bishop called an ordinary i call this putting old wines in new bottles just don't call it a bishop anymore call it an ordinary do what the roman catholic church wants to do you can still use your prayer books you can still use your church service but come to us come back to mama the author says how comical how delusory do these anglicans really believe they can remain anglicans and still be part of the catholic patriarchy i would advise them to consider the words of catholic archbishop of york dr Sentamu. quote if people genuinely realize that they want to be Roman Catholic, they should convert properly and go through catechesis and made proper Catholics." Unquote. Leading evangelicals such as Billy Graham, Bill Brights, Chuck Colson, Pat Robinson have all played their part in the strange crossing of the Tiber. Okay, let, let me stop you here, Yerk. <clears throat> There's a typo here. Many people may have already caught it, but he's talking about Pat Robertson, not Pat Robinson, Pat Robertson. Okay, the very, very uh, popular uh, pro uh, Baptist pastor who recently passed away. He's part of this ecumenical movement. As a matter of fact, he's a, a short robe Jesuit. He's a 33rd degree Freemason. And he was the one that I saw with my own two eyes when Benedict XVI was in the United States and meeting all the Protestant evangelical pastors across this country who were capitulating to him. Pat Robertson was sitting right in the middle of the church and the cameras caught him and they turned the cameras toward him. And it just so happened at the same time, Pat Robertson looked at the cameras with the biggest toothy smile I ever saw in my life. And I'm thinking, you traitor of Christ, you. You wicked sinner. Pat Robertson, the most famous, even ran for president in this country. He's the head or one of the many heads of this ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. And he's a 33rd degree Freemason. Did that tell you what Freemasonry is really all about? That's what it's all about. And uh, it, it pretends to be the great enemy of the Roman Catholic Church when, in fact, it is the Roman Catholic Church infiltrating the Protestant and Evangelical Church of this country and converting them to futurism, the belief that the Pope is not the Antichrist, <clears throat> but that the Antichrist is future, is not even in the world yet, and to have this unity, you have to unite with the Roman Catholic Church. That's why... Pat Robertson 
the, the, the Christian televangelist was in the very middle of this church, in the very middle of all the Protestant evangelical pastors sitting in the pews who were waiting their turn to go up and shake the hand and kiss the ring of the man of sin in Rome. I saw it with my own two eyes. This is not Pat Robinson, as this typo says. It was Pat Robertson. Okay, back to you, York. Yeah, the one who apparently died 8th of June, 2023. And uh, yeah. I just have the Wikipedia page of him open right here while Tom was speaking. And uh, everybody can look that up for themselves. Yeah, a typo can always happen here and there, of course. It's uh, very good, Tom, that you pay that much attention and can tell us uh, who was really talked about here. So leading evangelicals such as Billy Graham, Bill Brights, Chuck Colson, Pat Robertson have all played their parts in the strange crossing of the Tiber. To take just two of these men, Billy Graham had secret meetings with the Pope and was the most influential person behind President Reagan's re-establishing of diplomatic ties with the Vatican. Billy Graham has gone as far as to say, quote, I found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of Orthodox Roman Catholics, unquote. Well, perhaps his beliefs were indeed Catholic. Let's go further. Perhaps he was a secret Catholic. Chuck Colson is another that showed his papist leanings. In February 1977, Colson told the 35th Annual Convention of the National Association of Evangelicals, quote, I'm not certain that I may have convictions, over, um, convictions other than one, that, um, that we must end the divisions which have separated the believers historically and have weakened the impact of Christianity on 20th century America. You know, I am in a very ecumenical position. I am an Episcopalian. I love to go to Baptist churches nearby, particularly one Baptist church where the pastor is on the board of Prison Fellowship Foundation. My wife was Roman Catholic when I was converted, and she's remained in her church. But we must seek a fresh unity of spirit and a healing of the divisions which has crippled the impact of Christianity." Unquote. Now, first of all, of course, the, almost, the always uh, back-crawling mistake everybody in this book does when he does any kind of quotes is, of course, to equate Christianity with Roman Catholicism, which, which is just blasphemy, um, at least, that is to say about. But interesting, I find this last sentence because Tom, we were speaking about uh, the deadly wound that was afflicted to the beast in Revelation 13, uh, the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the rise of the papal Roman Empire as the healing of the wound. Uh, speaking of the second schisma, uh, schism when um, uh, Protestantism started or the Reformation started to come out of the Roman Catholic Church, I never forget it was a movement that came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, right. going back Catholic. into the Roman Catholic Church is just a natural way to do. There you go. But this sentence, the, the last sentence that he says here in this quote, is, uh, I, I find very intriguing. My wife was Roman Catholic when I was converted, and she's remained in her church. But... We must seek a fresh unity of spirit and a healing of the divisions. Healing of the wound. Here you have it. From um, Mr. Coles, Chuck Colson himself. Actually, um, just... Um, uh, what's the word... Confirming what I was saying earlier, this is the healing of a wound, <laughs> healing of the diversion. And I think um, that we are already uh, far above the hour, Tom, and we should continue next time on page 452 and read then what Robert Schuller has to say 
on uh, this subject. Very much looking forward to that. But of course, before we uh, break it off for today, I think that you still have uh, at least one final comment on the subject, don't you? Well, I've got more than one final comment. <laughs> I said at least one, yeah. I, I've known you for quite some time now, Tom. <laughs> yeah, and I could go on and on and on with this, and we've run out of time, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retreat to uh, uh, one comment, a quote from Billy Graham, and I want to point out something that might have been missed by, by the listeners. Billy Graham said, quote, I've found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of the Orthodox Roman Catholics, unquote. Did you get that? The Orthodox Roman Catholics. Okay, this is a slam to the Orthodox Church, which separated from the Roman Catholic Church. He's saying that Roman Catholicism is Orthodox, not the Eastern Church that calls itself Orthodox. He Billy Graham, a Protestant, a, so, a, a, a professing Protestant who is Roman Catholic to the core, always was. He's, you know, I, I could go on and on with this, but Billy Graham is the greatest betrayer of Christ that I can name you. He is chastig castigating the Orthodox Church forever leaving the Roman Catholic Church with this quote. I found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of the Orthodox Roman Catholics. He's talking about Roman Catholicism as the Orthodox Church. The true church, the one that has not been perverted, and the Orthodox Church of the Eastern wing of the Roman Catholic Church calls itself the Orthodox and 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 denounces Rome. Okay? Just a point that I just couldn't pass up. It may not mean a lot to other people, but Billy Graham, a Protestant, a so-called Protestant, uh, castigating uh, the Orthodox Church and calling the Roman Church Orthodox. I maybe just wanted even, to make... Maybe he's even getting further with that comment, Tom. No. Maybe he Go means ahead. maybe he means the Tridentine Orthodox Catholic Certain. Church. That could be very well what he's meaning too, although it's not you not not well spoken of, not well spoken here. Uh, but you may be well because the Roman Catholic Church is clearly divided now, and it's a great big war between the Trident, the Council of Trent Catholics, and the Vatican Council II Catholics. And uh, the Vatican Council, two Catholics are ecumenical. They want to unite with everybody and Satan himself. And the Tridentine, or the Council of Trent Catholics, want to return to the Roman Latin Mass. And they want to go back to uh, ultramontanism. The Pope is God on earth, and that everyone who opposes him should be destroyed. That's the Council of Trent Catholic. Those are the the Orthodox Catholic, according to their own de definition. They are Orthodox. They're ultramontane. They believe the Pope is God on earth. The Roman Catholic Church is the only church. All the other churches are apostates. All the other churches are heretics, and they, are, they deserve to be annihilated. That, that, is the real, that is the real point where, quote-unquote, the Christian Church or Christ is divided, Tom. Yes. Between trend and ecumenism. Yep. One wants to take them all with them, and the other one wants to go alone and kill all the others. Yeah. Yep. Now, the Bible says uh, that it'll be hard to find a man when Christ returns. Who do you yeah. think is going to win? Will I Who find faith in the world when I come back, Jesus Christ yeah. asked, huh? They want to annihilate the whole world that won't bow the knee to the Pope, just like Nebuchadnezzar said. You won't bow the knee to my image, I'll burn you in the fiery furnace. That's history foretold in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. Prophetic. Uh, or it is just there's nothing new under the sun, Tom. That's right. That's where this is all headed. It's where this is all headed. It's a war between Christ and Antichrist. 
And so far, the world and all of Christianity has decided to go with Antichrist. And it doesn't appear that they're going to repent either. So uh, if you find someone to agree with in this world, uh, you're very fortunate. The whole world is deceived. And it's only going to get worse. So hang on to the truth like your life depends upon it, because it does. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, hold on to the truth. That, of course, is the final statement of today, because the only truth in this world is to be found in the Bible, in the true word of God. And Tom and I both believe that that is the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. And if you do not know your Bible, don't say to anyone that you're a professing Christian, like the guy who I had in my taxi, who said he has the Bible as his foundation, and I just laughed into his face. Make sure that Christ does not laugh into your face when the day of judgment has come, but that you know his word and the, that you can make the distinction between the word of Christ and the word of Antichrist. Tom and I are just here, vessels to help you, no more and no less. And we look very much forward to see you next time. And in the meantime, we all hopefully read, study and understand the Bible. Maranatha. 